Hello, welcome back to my channel. So today will be my channel's final chapter for our Dracula read-along with chapter 26. Tomorrow, Steve will finish out the book with chapter 27. It has been an absolutely amazing uh, reading experience. I've had a blast doing it. I hope you all have had a blast listening and, and following along with the book. Uh, I do have my microphone visible. Uh, in today's video. I'm in a constant battle with trying to improve the audio on my videos and the last couple of videos I have had a humming, sort of a buzzing coming from my microphone so I thought maybe bringing it closer to my face and, and turning the gain down might improve that a little bit. So I do apologize that this is sort of obscuring a uh, part of the view. Hopefully it's not too big of a bother. I do think that it is going to help the end audio sound a lot better. Uh, hopefully that will be the case. But without any further ado, uh, let's jump right in to the chapter uh, 26. Dr. Seward's Diary, 29 October. This is written in the train from Varna to Glatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could. So far as thought and endeavor and opportunity go, we are prepared for the whole of our journey and for our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, Miss Harker prepared herself for her hypnotic effort, and after a longer and more strenuous effort on the part of Van Helsing than has been usually necessary, she sank into the trance. Usually she speaks on a hint, but this time the professor had to ask her questions, and to ask them pretty resolutely before we could learn anything. At, least her an at last her answers came. I can see nothing. We are still. We are still. There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water softly running against the wazer. I can hear men's voices calling near and far, and the roll and creak of oars in the oarlocks. A gun is fired somewhere. The echo of it seems far away. There is tramping of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. What is this? There is a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Here she stopped. She had risen as if impulsively from where she lay on the sofa and raised both her hands, palms upward, as if lifting a weight. Van Helsing and I looked at each other with understanding. Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly and looked at her intently, whilst Harker's hand instinctively closed round the hilt of his kirky. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up and she opened her eyes, and said sweetly, Would none of you like a cup of tea? You must all be so tired. We would only make her happy, and so acquiesced. She bustled off to get tea. When she had gone, Van Helsing said, You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth chest, but he has yet to come to get on shore. In the night he may lay hidden somewhere, but if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship do not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such case he can, if it be in the night, change his form and can jump or fly on shore as he did at Whitby. But if the day come before he get on shore, then unless he be carried, he cannot escape. And if he be carried, then the customs may discover that the, what the box contains. Thus, in fine, if he escape not on shore tonight or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time, for if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime boxed up and at our mercy, for he dare not be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said, so we waited in patience until the dawn, at which time we might learn more from Miss Harker. Early this morning we listened with, breath with breathless anxiety for her response in her trance. The hypnotic stage was even longer in coming than before, and when it came the time remaining until full sunrise was so short that we began to despair. Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort. At last, in obedience to his will, she made reply. All is dark. I hear lapping water level with me, and some creaking as of wood on wood. She paused, and the red sun shot up. We must wait till tonight. And so it is that we are traveling towards Galatz in an agony of expectation. We are due to arrive between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest we are three hours late, so we cannot possibly get in till well after sunup. Thus we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Miss Harker, 
either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. Later, sunset has come and gone. Fortunately, it came at a time when there was no distraction, for it had occurred whilst we were at a station. We might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. Miss Harker yielded to the hypnotic influence even less readily than this morning. I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensations may die away just when we want it most. It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. While she has been in the trance hitherto, she has confined herself to the simplest of facts. If this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. If I thought that the Count's power over her would die away equally with her power of knowledge, it would be a happy thought, but, I'm, but I am afraid that it may not be so. When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. Something is going out. I can feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear, far off, confused sounds, as of men talking in strange tongues, fierce falling water, and a howling of wolves. She stopped and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds, till at the end she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more, even in answer to the professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance, she was cold and exhausted and languid, but her mind was all alert. She could not remember anything but ask what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time and in silence. 30 October, 7 a.m. We are now near Galette's. I may not have time to write later. Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all. Knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance, Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time when she yielded with a still greater difficulty, only a minute before the sun rose. The professor lost no time in his questioning. Her answer came with equal quickness. All is dark. I hear water swirling by, level with my ears, and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle low, far off. There was another sound, a queer one like. She stopped and grew white, and whiter still. Go on, go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing in an agonized voice. At the same time, there was despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening even Miss Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes, and we all started as she said sweetly and seemingly with the utmost unconcern. Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything. Then, seeing the look of amazement on our faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look, What have I said? What have I done? I know nothing. Only that I was lying here, half asleep, and I heard you say, Go on, speak, I command you. It seems so funny to hear you order me about as if I were a bad child. Oh, Madame Mina, he said sadly, it is proof, if proof be needed, of how I love and honor you, when a word for your good, spoken more earnest than ever, can seem so strange because it is in order, it is to order her whom I am proud to obey. The whistles are sounding, we are near Galette's, we are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's Journal, 30 October. Mr. Morris took me to the hotel when our names had been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared, since he does not speak any foreign language. The forces were, distribu were distributed much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Goldeming went to the vice consul, as his rank might serve us in an immediate guarantee of some sort of the official, we being in extreme hurry. Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent to learn particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later, Lord Goldeming has arrived, the consul is away, and the vice consul sick, so the routine work has been attended to by a clerk, who is very obliging and offer to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's Journal, 30 October. At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, and I called on Mr. McKenzie of, Sten of, Sken of Steinkoff, the agents of London firm of Hapgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Goldeming's telegraphed request, asking them to show us any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the, Lord, the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbor. There we, there we sat, there were sat the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. He said that in all his life he had never had so favorable a run. Man, he said, but it made us afraid, for we expect that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of luck, so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run fr to run fray London to the Black Sea with a wind at, at you as though the devil himself were blowing on your sail for his own purpose. And at the time, we couldn't stare, we couldn't stare a thing. Jen, we were nigh in sight, or a port. 
or a headlong. A fog fell on us and traveled with us till when after it lifted and we looked out the dale a thing could be seen. We ran by Gibraltar, wouldn't being able to see a signal until we came to the Dardanelles and had to wait to get our permit to pass. We never were without tail aft. At first I inclined to slack off sail and beat about till the fog was lifted, but whiles I thought that of the dale was minded to get us to the Black Sea quick. He was like to do whether we would or not we would or no. If we had a quick voyage it would be not to our miscredit with the owners, or hurt our traffic and the old man who had served his own purpose would be difficultly grateful for us no hindering him. The mixture of simplicity and cunning of superstition and commercial reasoning aroused Van Helsen, who said, Mine friend, the devil is more clever, cr clever than he is thought by some, and he now and he know when he meet his match. The skipper was not displeased with the compliment and went on. When we go past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble, some of them. The Romanians come and ask me to heave overboard a big box which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man just before we had started for London. I had seen them spare at the fellow and put out their two fingers when he saw them to guard against the evil eye, but the superstition of foreigners was perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick, but I just as for a fog closed in on us, I felt a wee bit, as they did, against something, though I wouldn't say it was against the big box. Well, we went, well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let up for five days, I just let the wind carry us, for if the devil wanted to get somewhere, well, he would fetch it up all right, and if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way and deep water all the time, and two days ago, when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild, and wanted me right or wrong to take out the box and plunt it in the river. I hadn't I had to get angry about it with a hand spike, and at the last uh, and the last of them rose off the deck, his head his head in his hand. I had convinced them that evil eye or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners were better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had mined me, taken the box on the deck already to fling in, and as it was marked Galax, Galatz via Varna, I thought I let it lie till we discharged in the port and get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much clearing that day and had to remain the niche at harbor, but in the morning, broad, bright and early, an hour before sunup, a man came aboard with an order written to him from England to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was one ready to his hand. He had his papers a right and glad I was to be rid of the damn old thing, for I was beginning to myself feel uneasy at it. If the devil did have any luggage aboard the ship, I'm thinking it was the name either than it was it was the name either than the same. What was the name of the man who took it? asked Doctor Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. I'll be telling you quick, he answered, and stepping down to his cabin, produced a receipt signed Emanuel Hiddelsheim. Bergenstrasse 16 was the address. We found out that this was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. We found Heidelsham in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adolfi theater type, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with, spe with Specy. He began we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining he told us what he knew. This turned out to be, the simp to be simple but important. He had received a letter from Mr. Deville of London, telling him to receive, if possible for sunrise, so as to avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks and, trade, and traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for the work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Sinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed it over the box so as to save portage. That was all he knew. We then uh, sought for Sinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbors, who did not seem to bear him any affection, said that he had gone away two days before, no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house together with the rent due in English money. This had been between 10 and 11 o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. 
Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror, the women crying out, This is the work of a Slovak. We hurried away lest, lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair, and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at no definite conclusion. We were all convinced that the box was on its way, by water, to somewhere, but where that might be, we would have to discover. With heavy hearts, we came home to the hotel, to Mina. When we met together, the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal 30 October. Evening. They were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had some rest. So I asked them all to lie down for half an hour whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveler's typewriter and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done, poor dear, dear Jonathan, when he must have suffered what he must have suffered, what must he be suffering now. He lies on the sofa, hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears and claps. His brows are knit. His face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow. Maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh, if I could only help at it, I should do all I could. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully, and perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the professor's example and think about prejudice on the facts before me, and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get our party together and read it. They can judge it, as it is well to be accurate, and every minute is precious. Mina Harker's memorandum, entered in her journal. Ground of inquiry, Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by someone. This is evident, for had he power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as man, or wolf, or bat, or in some other way. He evidently fears discovery or interference in the state of helplessness in which he must be, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us. By road? By rail? By water? 1. By road. There are endless difficulties, especially in leaving a city. X. There are people, and people are curious, and, and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box would destroy him. Y. There are, or there might be, customs and extro... And Octroi officers for paths. Z. His pursuers might follow. This is his greatest fear, and in order to ver per in order to prevent his being betrayed, he has repelled so far as he can even his victim. Me. Two. By rail, there is no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal with enemies on the track. True, he might escape at night. But what would he be if left in a strange place with no refuge that he could fly to? This is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. 3. By water. Here is the safest way, in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water he is powerless except at night. Even then he can only summon fog and storm and snow and his wolves. But, where, but were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land, wherein he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was on the water, so what we have to do is to ascertain what water. The first thing is to realize exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his later task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action when he was pressed for a moment and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, we must see, as well as we can surmise from the facts we know of, 
what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Galatz and sent invoice to Varna to deceive us lest we should inter um, ascertain his means of exit from England. His immediate and sole purpose then was to escape. The proof of this is in the letter of instruction sent to Emmanuel Haldersham to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to Petrov Sinsky. There we must only guess at that there must have been some letter or message since Sinsky came to Heidelsham. That, so far, ha his plans were successful, we know. The Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey, so much so that Captain Donaldson's suspicions were aroused. But his superstition united with his um, kinesis played the Count's game for him, and he ran with the favoring wind through fogs and all till he brought up blindfolded at Glatz. That the Count's arrangements were well made has been proved. Adelshem cleared the box, took it off, and gave it to Sinsky. Sinsky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water, moving along. The customs and the uh, in the octroi, if there be any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the Count must have done after his arrival on land at Galatz. The box was taken to Sinsky before sunrise. At sunrise, the Count would appear in his own form. Here, we ask why Sinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Sinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the port, and the man's remark that the murderer, that the murder was the work of a Slovak showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is that in London, the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by... by um, Scani, and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks who took the boxes to Varna, for, for there they were shipped for London. Thus the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. When the box was on land, before sunrise or after sunrise, he came out from his box, met Sinsky, and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box up some river. The, when this was done, and he knew that all was in train, he blotted out his traces as he thought by murdering his agent. I have examined the map and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is either the Pruth or the Seret. I read in the typescript that in my tra trance I heard cows low and water swirling level with my ears and the creaking of wood. The Count in his box then was on a river in an open boat, propelled probably either by oars or poles, for the banks are near and it is work against and is working against stream. There would be no such sound if floating downstream. Of course, it may be, it may not, it may not be either the Sereth or the Pruth, but we may possibly investigate further. Now, of these two, the Pruth is the more easily navigated, but the Sereth is at Fundu, joined by the Bistritsa, which runs up round the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's journal continued. When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, Oh, dear Madam Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have seen what we, where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come on him by day on the water, our task will be over. He has a start but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave his box, lest those who carry him may suspect. For them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him in the stream where he perish. This he knows, and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam, a steam launched and follow, and follow him, said Lord Goldening, and I, horses to follow on the bank, lest by chance he land, said Mr. Morris. Good, said the professor, both good, but neither must go alone. There must be a force to overcome force, if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms. All the men smiled, for amongst them they carried a small arsenal, said Mr. Morris. I have brought some Winchesters. They are pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some other precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mr. Harker 
that Mrs. Harker could not quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points, Dr. Seward said. I think I had better go with Quincy. We, we have been accustomed to hunt together, and we too, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Art. I may, it may be necessary to fight the Slovaks, and a chance thrust, for I don't suppose these fellows carry guns, would undo all our plans. There must be no chances. This time we should not resist until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate. He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor deer was torn about in his mind. Of course he wanted to be with me, but then the boat service would, most likely, be the one which would destroy the, the, the vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and during his silence, Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave and can fight, and all energies may be needed at, at the last, and again, that it is your right to destroy him, that which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be my care, if I may. I am old. My legs are not so quick to run as once, and I am not used to ride so long or to pursue as need be, or to fight with lethal, lethal weapons. But I can be of other services. I can fight in other way, and I can die, if need be, as well as younger men. Now, let me say that what I would is this. While you, my Lord Goldeming, and friend Jonathan, go on your so swift little steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the banks where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madamina right into the heart of the enemy's country, whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream whence he cannot escape to land, for he dares not raise the lid of his coffin box lest the Slovak carrier should in fear leave him to perish. We shall go in the track where Jonathan went, from the strits over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here, Madamina's Hypn hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way, all dark and unknown otherwise. After the first sunrise, when we are near the fatal place, there is much to be done, and other places to be, to made, to be made sanctify, so that the nest of vipers be obliterated. Here Jonathan interrupted him hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case, and tainted as she is with the devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death trap? Not for the world, not for heaven or hell. He became almost speechless for a, min for a minute, and then went on. Do you know what the place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish in infamy, with the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes, and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind a devouring monster and embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? Here he turned to me, and as his eyes lit on my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry, Oh my God, what have we done to have this terror upon us? And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery. The professor's voice as he spoke in clear, sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh my friends, it is, it is, it is because I would save Madame Mina from the awful place that I would go. God forbid that I should take her into that place. There is work, wild work to be done there, that her eyes may not see. We men here, all save Jonathan, have seen with their own eyes what it is to be done before that place can be purified. Remember that we are in terrible straits. If the Count escapes us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep him for a country, for a century, and then in time our dear one, he took my hand, would come to him and keep him company, and would by as those others that you, Jonathan, saw, you would have told us of their gloating lips. You heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bag that the Count threw to them. You shudder, and I, and well may it be. Forgive me that I make you so much pain, but it is necessary. My friend, is it not a dire need for the, for the which I am giving, if need be, my life? If it were that anyone went into that place to stay, it is I who would have to go to keep them company. Do as you will, said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later. Oh, it did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can women help loving men when they are so earnest and so true and so brave? And two, it made me think of the powerful power of, of the wonderful power of money. What could it what could it not do when it is properly applied? And what might it do when basely used? I felt so thankful that Lord Goldeming is rich, and that both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, 
are willing to spend it so freely. For if they did not, our little expedition could not start, either so promptly or so well equipped, as it will within another hour. It is not three hours since it was arranged what part each of us was to do, and now Lord Goldemine and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch with steam up ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris have half a dozen beautiful horses well appointed. We have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 1140 train tonight to, Ver to Veresky, where we are to get a carriage to drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for, for we have no one whom we can trust in the matter. The professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have all got arms, even for me, a large bore revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest, alas. I cannot carry one arm with that the rest do, and the scar on my forehead forbids that. Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed, as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour, and there are snow flurries which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say goodbye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. The professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal, October 30, night. I am writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Goldeming is firing up. Is firing up. He is an unexpected, unexperienced hand at the work, and he has had for years a launch of his own on the Thames and another on the Norfolk Broads. Regarding our plans, we finally decided that Mina's guess was correct, and that if any waterway was chosen for the Count's escape back to his castle, the Sereth and then the Bistratza at its junction would be the one. We took it that somewhere about the 47th degree north latitude, we would be the place chosen for crossing the country between the river and the Carpathians. We have no fear in running at good speed up the river at night. There is plenty of water, and the banks are wide enough to wide enough apart to make seeming, even in the dark, easy enough. Lord Goldeming tells me to sleep for a while, as it is enough for the present for one to be on watch. But I cannot sleep. How can I, with the terrible danger hanging over my darling, and for going out into that awful place? My only comfort is that we are in the hands of God. Only for that faith it would be easier to die than to live, and so be quiet, so be quit of all the trouble. Mr. Morris and Dr. Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They were to keep up the right bank far enough off to get on higher lands, where they can see a good stretch of river and avoid the f following of its curves. They have, for the first stages, two men to ride and lead their spare horses, four in all, so as not to excite curiosity. When they dismiss the men, which shall be shortly, they shall themselves look after the horses. It may be necessary for us to join forces, if they can mount our whole party. One of the saddles had a movable horn, and can be easily adapted for Mina if required. It is a wild adventure we are on, here as we are rushing along through the darkness with the cold from the river seeming to rise up and strike us, with all the mysterious voices of the night around us, it all comes home. We seem to be drifting into unknown places and unknown ways, into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. Goldeming is shutting the furnace door. 31st October. Still hurrying along. The day has come, and Goldeming is asleep. I am on watch. The morning is bitterly cold. The furnace heat is grateful, but we have heavy fur coats. As yet, we have passed only a few open boats, but none of them had on board any box or package of anything like the size of the one we seek. The men were scared every time we turned our electric lamp on them and fell on their knees and prayed. 1st November. Evening. No news all day. We have found nothing of the kind we seek. We have now passed in the bis in into the Bistritza, and if we are wrong in our surmise, our chance is gone. We have overhauled every boat big and little. Earlier this morning, one crew took us for a government boat and treated us accordingly. We saw, it th we saw in this a way of smoothing matters, so at Fundu, where the Bistratza runs into the Sereth, we got a Romanian flag which we now fly conspicuously. With every boat which we have overhauled since then, this trick has succeeded. We have had very different shown to us, 
and not once any objection to whatever we chose to ask or do. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than usual speed, as she had as she had a double crew on board. This was before they came to Fundu, so they could so they could not tell us whether the boat returned. So they could not tell us whether the boat turned into the Bistratza or continued up on on up the Sarath. At Fondu, Fondu, we could not hear of any such boat, so she must have passed there in the night. I am feeling very sleepy. The cold is perhaps beginning beginning to tell upon me, and nature must have must have rest some time. Goldeming insists that he shall keep the first watch. God bless him for all his goodness to poor dear Mina and me. Second November morning. It is broad daylight. That good fellow would not wake me. He says it would have been a sin to, for I slept so peacefully and was forgetting my trouble. It seems brut brutally selfish of me to have slept so long and let him watch all night. He was quite right. I am a new man this morning, and as I sit here and watch him sleeping, I can do all that is necessary both as to minding the engine, steering, and keeping watch. I can feel that my strength and energy are coming back to me. I wonder where Mina is now, in Van Helsing. They should have got to Varesti about noon on Wednesday. It would take them some time to get the carriage and horses, so if they had started and traveled hard, they would be about now at the Borgo Pass. God help. God guide and help them. I am afraid to think what may happen if we could only go faster, but we cannot. The engines are throbbing and doing their utmost. I wonder how Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris are getting on. There seem to be endless streams running down from the mountains into this river, but as none of them are very large at present, at all events, though they are terrible doubtless in winter and when the snow when the snow melts, the horsemen may not have may not have met much obstruction. I hope that before we get to Strashba, we may see them. For if by that time we have not overtaken the count, it may be necessary to take counsel together what to do next. Dr. Seward's Diary, 2nd November. Three days on the road, no news, and no time to write, and no news, no news, and no time to write it there had been. For every moment is precious. We have had only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Those adventurous days of ours are turning up useful. We must push on. We shall never feel happy till we get the launch in sight again. 3rd November. We heard at Fundu that the launch had gone up the Bistritza. I wish it wasn't so cold. There are signs of snow coming, and if it falls heavy, it will stop us. In such cases, we must sledge, sledge on and go on, Russian fashion. 4th November. Today we heard of the launch having been detained by an accident when trying to force its way up the rapid. The Slovak boat got up all right by aid of a rope and steering with knowledge. Some went up only a few hours before. Goldeming is an amateur fitter himself, and, ev and evidently it was he who put the launch in trim again. Finally, they got up the rapids all night, all right, with local help, and are off to the chase afresh. I fear that the boat is not any better for the accident. The peasantry tell us that after she got upon the smooth water again, she kept step stopping every now and again so long as she was in sight. We must push on harder than ever. Our help may be wanted soon. Nina Harker's Journal, 31st October. Arrived at Varesti at noon. The professor tells me that this morning at dawn he could hardly hypnotize me at all, and that all I could say was dark and quiet. He is off now buying a carriage and horses. He says that he will later on try to buy additional horses, so that we may be able to change them on the way. We have something more than 70 miles before us. The country is lovely and most interesting, if only we were under different conditions. How delightful it would be to see it all. If Jonathan and I were driving through it alone, what a pleasant ple what a pleasure it would be to stop and see people and learn something of their life, and to fill our minds and memories with all the color and picturesqueness of the whole wild beautiful country and the quaint people, but alas, later. Dr. Van Helsing has returned. He has got the carriage and horses. We are to have some dinner and to start in an hour. The landlady is putting us up a huge basket of provisions. It seems enough for a company of soldiers. The professor encourages her 
and whispers to me that it may be a week before we can get any good food again. He has been shopping too, and has sent home such a wonderful lot of fur coats and wraps and all sorts of warm things. There will not be any chance of our getting co of our being cold. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone knows what may be, and I pray him with all the strength of my sad and humble soul that he will watch over my beloved husband, and whatever may happen, Jonathan may know that I loved him and honored him more than I can say, and that my, and that my latest and truest thought will be always for him. And that is the end of chapter 26. So Steve will conclude the reading of Dracula tomorrow with chapter 27. Um, and I'm not sure how we are going to be handling uh, closing out the book. Um, we will figure out how we want to end the reading and then um, um, fill in the information uh, from there. But t tomorrow, Steve will read the final chapter of the book. That'll be chapter 27. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.